Welcome everybody to our channel, uh, Kyork Immigration Law. I'm an immigration lawyer, and today we have a guest. It's uh, Amy Andraos. Uh, Amy is actually a very good friend of mine. We've known each other, I think, since 1995, so it's been over 20, like 25 years. Um, and Amy's a gu guidance counselor. She has her own firm, Salto Conseil. And today I have a number of questions for Amy because a lot of what she does can be very helpful in the videos that we discuss in our practice as an immigration lawyer, as an immigration law firm. I often um, reach out to her uh, for different situations with certain clients sometimes to get her feedback. Um, used to also use her services from, for recruitment, um, re recruitment aspects. And she's wonderful, she's amazing. She always has the right answers. Um, so Amy, what I'm going to do is I'm going to let you, uh, introduce yourself. Uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about exactly what you do, uh, your professional title and what type of services, uh, your off your office, uh, offers. Sure. Um, well, thanks for having me, first of all. Um, so yeah, our firm is called the Salto Conseil. We do different types of thing, uh, in the field of guidance counseling. So really we assist people in, in finding the job that best fits their personality. We assist people in changing jobs if they're not comfortable anymore where they are. And that could be for a number of reasons. It could be because life brings us different challenges. What if I had an accident and I can't do the job I used to do? What if uh, I just had a child and I realized that my, my new mom life doesn't fit with the old job I used to have? Uh, what if I'm close to retirement and wondering, well, what am I supposed to do with my time once, once I stop working? So all of these questions are things that we look at with our clients. Um, we could also be um, really entering the workforce. Uh, some people know exactly what they want to do, but they can't seem to find the job or they can't seem to really keep the job. So we help them with anything that could be uh, looking for a job or updating their CV, their LinkedIn profile, or um, doing a good, uh, a good interview uh, so that they get selected. So that's different things that we work on. We also do a bit of a recruit, re recruitment, like you said uh, earlier. And uh, what else is it that we do? Really anyone that could be indecisive about, uh, about uh, questions regarding their career. So, so that's mostly what we do. And we're based here uh, in Montreal, Quebec. And right now, I think you're in your office. I am in my office. So right now it's the pandemic, COVID-19. Um, I'm in my home, obviously. Um, so you, you do a lot of, a, kind of a variety of different services, it kind of uh, encompasses a lot of different things. I'm very lucky to be working with a, a team uh, of five other counselors, so six people total uh, that have different expertise. Mm -hmm. um, so it allows us to really work in, within the same field, but in different aspects of that field. Nice. And you have an order that regulates guidance counselors. Exactly. So it's a l'ordre des conseillers conseillères d'orientation du Québec. Mm -hmm. um, some of my uh, staff is a um, member of different orders. So uh, I, we have uh, une conseillère en ressources humaines agréées. Uh, so from l'ordre des conseillers conseillères ressources humaines agréées. Um, and uh, we have other people that aren't members of orders. So uh, les conseillers en emploi. So these people are really... Um, people that uh, help with employment, so uh, really uh, entering the workforce. Nice. Yeah. And uh, how long have you been uh, practicing as a guidance counselor? Uh, I've been a member of the order since 2011, okay. um, and, uh, but really working in the field uh, really since 2006. Nice. Mm -hmm. And uh, could you tell us a little bit about the studies that you completed to become a guidance counselor? Um, so I started out with a Bachelor of Science in Psychology and then did a master's of education in guidance counseling. Hmm. I find when I know about, about guidance counselors because of you. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the only other thing I knew in the past was usually someone in the school and in high school, for example, that used to answer student questions and do some tests. But what I've learned over the years with you is that it's so broad, it's so important, and often people won't think about that when they're, uh, they need services. Why, why do you think that is? That's a very interesting question. I think, um, well, first of all, we're, we're not that many people. So uh, in the order, we're 2,600 people. So in all of Quebec, 
yeah, in all of Quebec, that's really not a big, um, a big population, right? Um, so that's the first reason. Not many people know a guidance counselor, so then they don't really have that exact information. Um, the other reason is that it's a job that used to only exist in schools. Um, originally, the job uh, was created uh, in wartime, right? So during the war, uh, people would test the new soldiers mm -hmm. to figure out what part of the army they should be in. Wow. So that image of really, I'm testing you and telling you what you should do, it comes from somewhere. Historically, that's what the job used to be like uh, 60 years ago, right? right? I'm saying 60, but it's probably not the right number, but yeah. uh, during wartime, let's say. Um, but since, let's say, maybe the last 30, 40 years, the, the work has really evolved a lot and uh, gotten very wide and very broad. And so that image of the guidance counselor in the schools is not false. I mean, it's about 50% of the guidance counselors, but then again, the others, because there's so little of them, uh, sometimes we don't know what they do or we don't even know that they exist. Yes. So um, it's a, yeah, like you said, I think a profession uh, really worth uh, knowing about because I really do think that we are an asset to, to society. Oh, definitely. I've, uh, I've done the process myself at some stage in my career where I was thinking of maybe teaching law in a CJEP or university, and I found the process extremely interesting. I learned a lot about myself. There's a lot of uh, self-introspection that goes on with that. It's like a little bit of therapy at the same time. You have to look into what you want to do and what your qualities are and your strengths, and um, it was quite amazing. So Yeah, yeah. we are. I, I, I'm always... Uh... I'm always surprised when people tell me this because to, the, to me, it's like my bread and butter, right? It's what I do, but uh, we're not uh, psychotherapists. So I'm not allowed to say that we do therapy, but it does have a therapeutic feel, yes. what we do, because we do look at the entire person before thinking of what they should be doing. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, now, if you could briefly describe to us your day-to-day -day work, like maybe a typical day at the office for you. Um, I would say maybe I could divide it in two types of typical days. Um, a typical day really I, as a guidance counselor in a private practice would be seeing clients. So for me, it varies quite a bit. It could go from four clients a day to seven clients a day. Um, seven is a, a bit much. I try to not do it too often yes. because that's seven hours of counseling. Lots. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but from four to seven a day, uh, different people, different needs, uh, different uh, things to assess and discuss. Mm -hmm. um, so that could be a typical day, just really being uh, in sessions with clients. Um, another type of typical day could be really uh, more business oriented for me because, because I don't work alone and because I have a, a small firm, um, then there's the whole like checking the bills and paying stuff and answering uh, potential clients and answering uh, counselors questions and, uh, doing networking and marketing and ambulance just passed by. I don't know if you heard. Um, so the entrepreneur side of things. Exactly, exactly. So that would be mostly what I do uh, with my work time. Yes. And uh, you, if I understand correctly, you mainly work in uh, French, but you can also offer services in English. Exactly. I usually work in French, so that's why you'll, you'll hear me stutter quite a bit today. Um, but I'd say maybe 10 to 20% of our clientele is uh, Anglophone. Oh, nice. Very nice. Um, and what tools do you use in your work? So that's a good question. Um, we use um, a lot of statistics. We use a lot of numbers, um, mostly uh, statistics linked to the, the labor market. So uh, those stats are provided by the government, so uh, the Quebec government or the Canada government, the Canadian government, um, to see, so let's say, um, this job XYZ, whatever, is it in demand? How in demand is it? How much does it pay? Uh, in what, um, in what uh, field do they usually work? So that's uh, a lot of um, the tools that we use are really stats. Um, another tool that we can use is uh, really known, LinkedIn. We do a lot of research. We, lo we do a lot of, uh, okay, you'd like to be like this person. What has this person done? So looking at different profiles. Mm -hmm. um, we also use, um, there's information banks uh, where jobs are described. So it helps us um, describe the reality of, of the market to different people that are looking at different jobs. Um, and another tool that we use uh, from time to time is uh, psychometric te testing. Yes. So the tests um, 
I think are, are kind of uh, mythical in the minds of certain people. A lot, a lot of people think that uh, I'll pass a test and then it'll, it'll tell me who I am and what I should be doing. Yes. Um, it does have a, a bit of a magical thing to it, but it's really uh, statistics again. Yes. So uh, psychometric testing, um, it's really a case by case thing. We always look at if it's necessary to use that type of a tool with someone or if it isn't. Um, and if it is, uh, usually tests measure three types of thing. Um, we can measure uh, interests. So mm -hmm. what do you like? What do you not like? Uh, we can measure personality. So that's basically that there's different theories about personality and all theories kind of all say that there's different personality types and say that because we're human beings and we're complex and complicated, we probably all have all of the types of personality inside ourselves, but um, at different levels. Mm -hmm. So personality testing is really used to see, so what type of personality seems to be the loudest in this person? Mm -hmm. um, and the last uh, type of testing is uh, aptitude testing. And so that's to see how good you are at different tasks. So it could be very general, how good are you at languages, at math, but it could be also very uh, specific. So how quickly can you do this thing with your fingers? How quickly could you um, um, fix a puzzle? How quickly could you uh, write? How quickly could you type on a computer? So that's uh, all kinds of uh, testing that we could do for different situations. It's so interesting. Um, I remember when I did my sessions with the gu uh, guidance counselor, um, it, it was really revealing that for me, I like, there was, I think it was like what you mentioned, three things, working with people, uh, uh, working with ideas and working with things. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and, uh, for me, it was very obvious that it was working with people and working with ideas. And, uh, it explained a lot why I don't like computer stuff mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm an immigration lawyer and we do, you know, everything is administrative and forms and, uh, what it made me realize is my team, we need to have people that really like, enjoy doing that administrative part of part of paperwork some part i enjoy uh, i mean i enjoy like let's say photocopying you know at the printer i enjoy that or scanning but i don't enjoy opening a pdf document and writing things and then it doesn't work i just i get and then it made me feel better understanding that it's not because i'm impatient or because i don't want to learn it's just it's not my personality that's why i really enjoy doing consultations and strategizing on the different files so it was very enlightening mm -hmm. Um, this is a bit of a random thing. Yesterday I was listening to a Brene Brown podcast and she was interviewing someone about inyo Enneagrams. I don't know mm -hmm. if you've heard that. Mm -hmm. You're talking about nine personalities. Does that have to do anything with your uh, testing or that's completely separate? Um, so Enneagram, I only know it in French. Um, I'm not a specialist, so I don't want to, I don't want to say stuff that's not correct. Uh, there might be tests that exist, but originally, if I understand it properly, it's really a theory. It's mm -hmm. really a way of seeing personality. Yes, that's what they were saying. It was very mm -hmm. fascinating. Uh, very interesting. Very, very interesting. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, what, uh, what made you get into this field? Uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's a whole story. <laughs> um, so I've always known that I wanted to help people for a living. Um, but there's different ways of helping, right? So being a, being a kid, really, uh, finishing high school, um, I was advised uh, by, by the, the school principal to go into psychology. And I think uh, that's an advice that a lot of people give uh, kids that are interested in helping, in, in, in helping people because psychology is kind of like the most known a field of, of counseling, right? So uh, I went into psychology and while I was doing my bachelor's degree, um, I was enjoying it. It was very interesting to me, but at the same time, I, I, I was doing different things. I was playing music, I was traveling, I was doing humanitarian projects, and um, I was really enjoying all these other things and wondering if I really wanted to stay in psychology or if I wanted to do something different, maybe more creative, maybe, um, maybe more... Um, like factual, I wasn't sure, I was really confused. And I went to, to my father, who was a very uh, wise man, and uh, told him, I'm confused, I don't know what I wanna do, I might stop school, I might do this little side program and think about it. And he was like, no, that's not what you're gonna do. <laughs> so being the strict immigrant man that he was. Um, and so he advised me to go and, and meet with the guidance counselor myself. Oh, 
So um, I went and I did the process and I thought it was fascinating what he was doing. And I thought it was, I really liked his approach and I really liked how his, it was linked to psychology that I did enjoy. But at the same time, it had this very like grounded feel. It was really like um, concrete, right? It was really, you're thinking this, this is what we could do. It was really... Um, there's a methodology. Action. There's a methodology and it's very action oriented. Yeah. And uh, that really spoke to me. So, uh, so yeah, I decided to, to take up the master's in, in guidance counseling and that's how it happened. Well, I didn't know that was uh, the process. That's so cool to know. Yeah. Yeah. And I was very lucky to, to eventually work with that man. That was my guiding, my guidance counselor. And then one day even take his office at uh, l'Université de Montréal. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's wow. World. Cool. Um, what would you say is the best and worst part of your job? Um, the best part of my job is kind of linked to what I just said. Um, you can see a direct effect of your work on people. And that is really, really rewarding to see someone who's uncomfortable at work, um, eventually find some kind of, of well-being and some kind of uh, excitement about their job is really, really validating really really rewarding so i think that that's really the best part of what i do um the worst part um you gave me the questions beforehand so i thought about it and it was really hard for me to to figure out that part because i really do enjoy my job um but i think the worst part is realizing that you can't help everyone yeah um and i'm sure that's something that you must feel in in your job as well um there's people that aren't ready for change. There's mm -hmm. people that aren't able to change for different reasons. Sometimes life isn't uh, so easy and it's not always possible no. to, to get what you want. Um, and so it, I find that there's a lot of work that we can do anyways with everyone. There's always things that we can look at. There's always little things that we can tweak so that you feel better, better in your day-to-day -day work life. But, um, but sometimes it's hard to see that... Uh, that work can be an, a lot of uh, suffering to certain people and you, you can't always fix it. Mm -hmm. And I feel we are the type of people that are helpers. Mm -hmm. So when, you know, want to kind of help everybody, whoever comes to see us, but like you said, uh, same thing in our office, you know, sometimes people come and we want to help, but there's no way there's just because of the situation, the immigration status it's, and I'm very honest, I could say, I want to help you, but I can't. And I find now, after many years of practice, it's easier to say bluntly, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Whereas in the beginning, it was like, let me try to figure things out. And, but but it, it's actually better for the client to, to have a very straightforward answer for them. You know? And often also, I think it's, it's, a, it's very professional to have the, the humility to say uh, that maybe I'm not the right person to help you right now. Yes. Maybe you need another type of help. Maybe it could be looking at your finances. Maybe it could be looking towards therapy. Maybe it could be different steps that you need to do before looking at your yes. career or immigration in your case. But uh, yeah, I think it's very important to know that we can't do everything. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about how you assist someone who comes and see someone comes and sees you and they want to do a career change? What would kind of briefly be the steps? Um, of course, it's always very different from, from person to person because everybody's needs are different. But um, generally speaking, we could see three major steps. The first step is really introspection. It's really figuring out who you are, what you need, where you're at right now in your life, what is central, what is essential. Um, once that's done, once we have the essence of who you are and kind of what you need to be focusing on in your search, uh, then we go to the second step, that's exploration. So exploration is really looking at what's out there. And so it could be looking at the labor market. It could be looking at uh, different programs if you're about to go back to school or about to go to school for the first time. Uh, so it's really about seeing what exists and what could match what I just said that was interesting, that was important to me. So in that step, it's really important to not focus on one single goal because you never know what life brings you, right? So maybe you will have a plan A and a B and a C and a D. And once we have a couple of plans that might work, then we bring that to mm -hmm. the last step that is action. Mm -hmm. So action is really 
the game plan. So what are we doing? If I want to get to this position, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to go back to school? If so, do I have the grades? If so, do I have the background? Um, am I supposed to meet people that have that job and discuss with them so that I can get known? Is, am I supposed to um, get a bit of money before so that I can be able to, so, so that I'll be able to afford my studies? So it's like really looking at la uh, feasibility. So how is it, um, how reachable that project is? and really figuring out how exactly to do it. When am I applying? What's the deadline? How much is it gonna cost? How much is it gonna bring me? So it's also, it's also in that step that uh, we try to encourage people to meet with professionals that do the job that interests them so that they can discuss, okay, I imagine the job to be like this, but when you do it on a random Friday morning, you wake up and you turn on your computer, what happens next in your day, right? So discussing with, with people that are really on, in the field um, is kind of the, the key element at the end that can show you if you saw it correctly, if this is something that could be worth it for you, or if maybe you should be looking at something else. Wow, very interesting. Um, it's a whole process. It's basically. a whole process. And usually do this process in how many sessions? It varies a lot. Um, in our firm, I'd say between four and six sessions. Mm -hmm. uh, but for some people... Some people like to take their time and like to look at many things. It could be 20 sessions. It really depends oh. on the person. And the session will be approximately an hour. Yeah, 15 minutes to an hour. Nice. And um, I just thought of this. What about situations where people enjoy their jobs, but there's aspects they don't enjoy? So, for example, in the immigration uh, law world, I have a lot of immigration lawyer friends, a lot of um, paralegal paralegals, law clerks, legal assistants throughout my career. When I, before I opened my practice, I've, I've made a lot of friends and uh, some of them work in uh, places where they love the work. They love helping people. They love immigration law. They like working on the applications. Um, even though immigration can be very chaotic, they enjoy the challenges, but they don't like the work environment in terms of the hours and the very stressful, demanding um, caseloads and things like that. So what can someone do or how could you help someone like this? That's a very interesting question. And it's something that we see very often. Um, certain theories say that work can be kind of broken down in three big uh, notions, right? So it's the work environment, mm -hmm. um, the method. So how do you do what you're supposed to do? and um, the tasks. So what am I actually doing? Uh, so in any of those three uh, sections, uh, something could go wrong, right? Let's say I don't like where I work. I don't like my colleagues. I don't like my job, uh, my, my, my boss, sorry. I don't like um, physically where it is. I've seen people that say I work in a basement. I can't see sunlight. I'm sick of it, you know? Um, some people could say, so that's like really physically where you are. Some people could say, I don't like how things are run. It's too chaotic, like you said, or it's too, the hours are crazy, or th there's too many meetings. I, I want to just mm. sit down and focus, right? Uh, or it could be the tasks. It could be, I think I could do more than what is asked of me. I think, or it's too hard what they're, what they're asking me to do. I can't do it. It's too complicated. Or I'm not interesting. I'm not interested in, uh, let's say, um, entering data in an Excel sheet. So any of these three um, the parts of work could hurt someone and make them uncomfortable in their job and so what we do really depends it really really depends sometimes it could be changing your perspective maybe you can learn to not care so much what your boss says mm -hmm. or the tone she uses sometimes it could be um well maybe this is unacceptable and maybe you're being bullied and maybe this is harassment and you should leave mm -hmm. um, sometimes it could be um well, what can I do to minimize? Maybe it's better if I write letters or emails instead of uh, talking face-to-face -face with this person. That's problematic to me. So there's really a million, there's as many answers as there are problems, I think. Right. And I feel, uh, you can confirm this, I feel with the COVID-19, there's a lot of people that are going to revisit and rethink their work environment and their situations because I feel the world has kind of come to a pause and we're realizing how fast-paced stressful life we were living and i i feel some people might be like well do i still want to do this job or do i still want to do it like this you know i think there's a major shift that's coming um i can't 
be sure of anything. I don't have a, a crystal ball or anything, but I know that uh, already you see a lot of, uh, of businesses um, deciding that maybe don't, they don't need to rent such a huge office. Maybe they can have a lot of people working remotely and uh, performance is still there. They're still working very well. Um, I think a lot of people are realizing that if I'm not spending three hours a day commuting yep. and just having three hours more to work or to spend time with my family or to do sports or to play music or whatever, uh, well, maybe my life is better if I yep. do it that way. So I think uh, a lot is going to change. I don't know exactly how or when or if it's going to be a stable change or if it's going to go back to how it used to be because profit is very important in our society. Um, I think a lot of people are right now at home and wondering wondering what it is that they want out of life and out of their jobs. I think a lot of people are concerned also about the environment and the impact that all this commuting has on the planet. Um, this might be a personal thing, but I think a lot of people share that view. Um, and so, yeah, I think it will have an impact what we're going through right now. I'm not sure exactly how, but definitely. Yes. I hope uh, that positive changes come out of the so difficult situation that we're in. For me personally, when I, I go for walks and I see parents flying kites with their children, I see artists in the forest painting, never seen that in my neighborhood. I see neighbors doing projects. They they've been, finally have the time to do it. And even us, me and my husband at home, you know, we have, let's say, patio furniture we've been wanting to paint for so long. And now it's like, okay, let's go on YouTube and see how we can actually do this. It's just, I find we have the gift of time and uh, it's, then we realize how precious it is uh, nowadays. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your cultural background, your upbringing, and how this shaped you in, the terms, of, in, in terms of how you communicate and work with your clients? Um, yes, so I'm a, I'm a child of immigrants. Um, my parents uh, immigrated to Canada in the 70s from Egypt. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I'm a... I think I'm a pretty typical child of immigrants in the sense that I, I, I had the privilege to uh, be introduced at the same time to two cultures. Um, I had my, my family's culture that was like brought to me in everyday life, right? In the kitchen and with my family and the parties and, and the parties and church and life. Um, and at the same time, while I was going to school and I had friends in the neighborhood. And so I discovered the, Canadian culture and uh, and Quebec culture as well. Um, and so as an immigrant's child, I think, yeah, I had the luxury of, of picking and choosing what parts of which culture I wanted to keep and which part of which cultures I felt like uh, giving back to, to people who were offering it to me. So um, how does that influence me today? Um, I think I'm very lucky to have uh, seen uh, in depth both these cultures and understood uh, why and how they came about and of course it's like very complex I'm not an expert but I, I I've lived them so I have that experience and um, how it impacts how I deal with people I think maybe there's a sense of empathy mm -hmm. that, that can be there towards uh, maybe an immigrant clientele or a children of immigrants who are really who I'm closest to um, and just, I'm in Montreal, right? And it's a very diverse city. And I think, okay, my parents are from Egypt, but I think a lot of immigrants have um, stories that can resemble each other, right? Mm -hmm. So the stories of coming with nothing and trying to make your life free for yourself and building something. And uh, yeah, I think I have maybe that sensitivity, sensitivity to, it might not be that easy, right? Yes, yeah. exactly. I find uh, a bit similar to you because of my cultural background. Um, I was born in, in Montreal. Um, my mother is born in Armenia. My father is born in Syria. My uh, grandparents, everybody's Armenian, but they were from Lebanon and uh, lived in uh, certain areas where it was controlled by, by Turkey. So there's a mixture of all these different cultures. And I find that in the work that I do now, it really helps me in the way I communicate and deal with clients. So for example, you know, if I have a, a family from Lebanon that comes into my office, I know that they don't need me to get into the point right away. We need to chit chat a little bit. We need to ask, 
you know, where you're from, what do you do, what's your story, and talk about the weather. And in the beginning, I used to kind of fight that when I first became a lawyer, but now I've completely switched and I actually really enjoy that part of my work because I, I feel I can really relate. And uh, me personally, as a lawyer, I, I often bring my own personal experiences. It's not every profession that can do that, but I bring my own personal experiences of, of my life with the clients. And I find it's just creates like this human interaction. And I'm actually very grateful um, that I have this background and that I can give back to my clients in this way. Um, okay. Now, um, do you work a lot with newly arrived immigrants? Um, at the beginning of my career, when I had, when I was actually still finishing my master's, I did. Uh, I worked um, in a in an ONG that did only that, worked with uh, immigrants and people that were newly arrived. Um, I did that for maybe uh, a year, less than a year, and uh, then started working in different uh, other aspects of, of, of my field. And so today, no, not so much. I really don't see that many new uh, newcomers um, because um, there's really great um, government programs Mm -hmm. that offer the same services as me but that specialize with um new 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 uh, immigrants but also that are free and mm -hmm. so when somebody calls me um and that fits that profile uh, i tend to just refer them to to, to those uh, organizations because they're so great at what they do and i don't feel comfortable charging someone for yes. for, for that type of service if they can get it somewhere else for free yes. yeah and I've learned that with you because and I think for a long time I would often call you and be like, this client has this issue, can you help? And you'd be like, no, I mean, I can, but there's this organization that organization. So now I know exactly when to contact you uh, when I have certain inquiries. So, uh, and it, it was great for me to know that, you know, I, you, you know, you specialize in one thing you don't know. It's great to know that there's so many services out there because in our work, we do immigration applications, but clients will ask us questions about employment, about how to get their SIN number, how to get the healthcare coverage, how to apply for a job, um, can they buy property, and uh, what about accounting? So it's really good as an immigration lawyer to have these different referral systems so that we can, if we can help, at least we can refer the client to the right person. Um, related to our practice in immigration law, do you offer any services to foreign nationals outside Canada who are interested in moving to Canada? Uh, so for example, like a student, let's say you get a phone call that says, uh, I live in Abu Dhabi, uh, I want to come to Canada and, uh, I'm thinking of studying this program. Um, can you help me? Mm -hmm. So it's not a service that we promote very much because it's not uh, our main uh, clientele, but, uh, we have worked with people in, uh, in, uh, other countries. We've worked with people in, uh, in Colombia, people in Mexico and people in, in France mostly, um, so it was always re related to, to studies. So it was always like, this is the background I have. This is the grades that I have. Can I get into this or that program? And then discussed uh, how we could uh, assist them in, in finding out where to find the information because yes. we're not the admission recruiters um, at universities or at CGEP. So our job is really to say, okay, this is the, the information that we can find because sometimes it's a bit hard to digest when you're not from, from the country. So this is the information we have. This is how to understand it. Now to have further information, here's who you should contact yes. to really see what's possible for you in your situation. And that could be very helpful because, you know, if somebody Googles study in Canada, they'll have a bunch of things. But if they speak to you, you might just, just point them to the right direction and they could be like, okay, call this school, this registration department. And that, that's already a big step forward for them, right? Hmm. Um, what about, and this happens a lot uh, in our world, um, I mean, I don't do a, a economic immigration applications, uh, but we do get inquiries and I have a referral system, but I hear a lot from uh, other colleagues who discuss this. They get phone calls from people or inquiries that say, I'm a doctor in my country, I'm a pharmacist, I'm an engineer, I want to come to Canada. Um, I have my papers, I've become a permanent resident, maybe through points or through a spousal sponsorship application, um, and I want to work in my field. So can you help someone in this situation? So this is a very, um, a very common question. Um, 
and it's very delicate because it's so different depending on the field of that person. Mm -hmm. um, we can help very quickly by answering um, when it's when it's a profession that it that has an order that has a professional order. Um, it's very simple. The order decides whether you can have the title or not. So depending on the studies you've done, depending on the country you're from, where you did your studies, uh, what uh, uh, professional um, experience you have, it's going to vary. Mm -hmm. So the, the quick answer is contact the order and mm -hmm. they'll tell you exactly what you need to do or what's missing. Some orders are more proactive than others. Some are really quick. They kind of give you um, like a, a prescription. Okay, so in your, in your um, file, this is what we see. So this is what you're missing. This is what you should go get. Apply here, there. This is what you do. Uh, other orders may take more time to answer, but they're always the ones that you should be contacting. For other fields that don't have an order, then more research needs to be done because uh, the market is ever-changing and we always need to look at um, will you be able to access the workforce right away when you get into the country or not. Also, one thing that's very important uh, to mention is that the information that I have is really based on uh, the, the Quebec labor market. Um, so it might vary from a province to province. Mm -hmm. And it's important for people uh, to know as well that every province has its own requirements. Yeah. Um, so for example, myself, I'm licensed in both Quebec and Ontario. But to do that, I had to meet a lot of different criterias. Um, and it was not so much necessarily complex, but there's a methodology and system you have to go through. So, you know, when someone calls and says, I want to immigrate to Canada, okay, well, which province do you, you know, if it's Quebec, there's French, do you want to go to British Columbia? It's a whole other set of rules. So that's also something to consider when, when you're thinking about coming to, to Canada. Um, what about entrepreneurs? So successful businessmen outside Canada, they've been running their business for 10, 15 years. It could be, you know, a garage, a jewelry store. It could be import export. They, they, they're business people and they know how to run the show over there. Uh, so they, they want to come here or they're here and they want to do the same thing. How, what, what's your experience? How, how does it kind of go for them? Again, I would say it needs a little bit of research because the market is different everywhere. Um, I don't know. What if I was, um, what if my business was uh, in the Caribbean and it was um, renting out boats uh, to tourists? Well, if you're in Montreal, there's not a lot of boat rental going on. No. So, um, <laughs> so it's always about seeing if your business is transferable here. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's a bunch of other questions that are really purely financial. So mm -hmm. any business owner, whether it be a newcomer or not, um, will have to face those uh, really financial challenges so yeah. do you have the money do you have the time to invest in building something from scratch do you so those are all questions that need to be looked at really in a case-by-case -case manner mm -hmm. and related to that what would you say um is the biggest challenge when someone wants to move to canada and find employment to find and the employment portion that's Really interesting. I wish there was a single answer. I'm going to be boring and say the exact same thing as before. It really depends. It really depends. Let's say uh, we see what's going on right now with COVID-19. There's a crazy need for nurses. There's a crazy need for, um, I don't know how you say it in English, but the préposés aux bénéficiaires. Yes, uh, nurses, uh, hospital um We'll find, we'll find it. We'll write it. Frontline workers, maybe. Yeah. yeah. So basically, it's like in the whole hierarchy of um, of nursing, there's many different uh, steps and les préposés aux bénéficiaires are one of them. So there are people that care, uh, they, that are in direct contact mm -hmm. with patients and that tend to their basic, basic needs. So uh, anything that could be like feeding people or uh, bathing them or... Um, like just moving them around, taking them out for a walk, talking to them. So they're, they're like an essential mm -hmm. part of the, the workforce and we need them. Like we really need them and we don't have enough right now. Mm -hmm. And um, so if today with everything that's happening, if someone were to say, I'd like to immigrate to Canada and this is the job I've been doing, then they'd have a great advantage and right. they would like enter the workforce really quickly. Um, I think, I hope, I think. Um, but in other fields, then maybe it wouldn't be this easy. So how do you enter the workforce 
it really depends. Mm. It really depends on what you do. But like for everything else, I think there's some key things that could be looked at. For example, um, networking. Mm -hmm. The more people you know in your field, mm -hmm. the more chances you have of finding something. Yes, um, yes. In certain fields, it could be interesting to do volunteer work just to mm -hmm. get your name running and just so that people know your face and remember you when they actually have a, a job offer coming up. Um, it could also be in certain fields, you have no choice and you have to go back to school. So it's really, it really good. It's really going to depend. Yeah. Um, we, we often get asked the question, you know, people call us and they'll, for example, oh, I'm from Costa Rica. I'm here on a visit for four months and eventually I'm thinking of staying here. Uh, and they start applying for jobs sometimes right away. And then they, they, they come see us and they're like, well, I can't find anything. So the advice that I usually give is, well, you know, exactly like that. Like try to meet people, do interviews, understand the culture by living here, doing certain activities, you meet people and that might lead to something. But it's never, you know, I think sometimes people think uh, like Canada, the land of the dreams and everything comes easy. They hear things, right? So for example, I had a, a client who came from the Middle East and he had a big import export business, very successful. And I remember when he first came to see us, he, he, had seven, he, has, he has seven children and he wanted to, um, to work right away. And he was so enthusiastic and so excited. And every week I would see him. And as the weeks went by, the enthusiasm just went down and down and down because he realized everywhere he tried to go, there was walls because of the French and, uh, or the English. And, uh, and then you see that kind of devastation in their face. And, and it's hard for me because, you know, what you, I don't do what you do. And uh, I try to give tips and advice. And now what I say, the only thing I say is, well, learn the languages, wait, especially if it's the winter time. I'm like, wait till the winter passes. Summer will come. You'll feel better. Uh, and then what I notice happens is the children go to school, which is amazing. And they end up learning French and English quite well. So every time I see them in my office, the children, the, they're so good at the languages and they start helping with the paperwork, but some parents become better with the languages and some parents, they're just refused. They just, they, they don't, they don't want to go to school. And, uh, and I often tell them, well, la language is where you start, right? So what do you think about that? I think, especially being here in Quebec, French is major it's mm. super important to at mm. least speak a little bit of French uh, if you want to find work you will be able to find work uh, potentially without the French but it's about 10 times harder if mm. you don't speak it so French is really really exactly like you said that's very good advice a place to start most definitely mm. also to remember that again there's a whole uh, network of organizations that teach French but that also help with finding jobs so by going there, you could learn French, you could learn how to look for a job, but you could also network. You could also meet new people. You could also, and these organizations often have also uh, links with different companies. Mm -hmm. So they might know that this company always needs people. You could go, you could start working there because as soon as you get that one Quebec experience on your CV, it's always a little bit easier to find a second job after because um, I guess for, uh, for different employers, it gives them that kind of uh, confidence of like, okay, so somebody else trusted them with the work. They're probably a trustworthy person. I should, I should try. Mm -hmm. um, and I find it fascinating now that I'm uh, at this stage in my career. Sometimes I think of my grandmother. She lived here for over 40 years and she just knew like five words in French and like four words in English. Like, oui, chérie, oui, okay, oui, yes, oui, bonjour. And it's crazy because... If you want, you could really bypass learning anything because of the multiculturalism. You could just stay with the same people in your family and just never have to learn. But if you make that effort in the beginning, uh, which is hard, uh, things can be very different for you. And I think also time is maybe have changed since yeah. uh, since your grandmother's generation where maybe women uh, tended to stay more at home and tend to the children and the family um now most women work right so if you intend on working then again yes. language will be central to you finding what you're looking for
And the good thing now with the Quebec government is that they actually pay you to go and learn French. Um, so that's pretty amazing. It's like, not only do you don't have to pay, but we will pay you go and learn. Uh, so I think that was a great program, a great incentive for people to, to go and learn the language. Yeah. It's a plus for everyone. Yeah. Um, so I'm from Montreal. I lived in Toronto for five years. Uh, that's where I opened my business and I came back to Montreal uh, and now I, I live back in Montreal and having lived in both cities, I, I feel I have two homes and because I really lived in Toronto for five years, I, I, I could see the, the biggest differences between Montreal and Toronto. So what I tell people when they ask me, a lot of clients be like, oh, I want to come to Canada. Should I go to Montreal? Should I go to Toronto? It's funny to me because it's so different. It's such a they kind of make it seem like, oh, here or there, but it's really, for me, it's two separate worlds. So what I tell people is, for me, Montreal is more laid back. It's more easygoing. It's more friend, not, I don't want to say friendly, but it's, Toronto is actually really, really friendly too, even more sometimes more than Montreal. It's more like that um, laid back cultural European style, uh, lifestyle where, yes, we work hard, people work hard here, but people really value the time with family and not this kind of go, go, go lifestyle. For me personally, what I experienced in Toronto is a very, very, very fast paced uh, culture, city, uh, innovation, um, buildings going up all the time. Every time I go, if I go, you know, three months later, there's a whole new building. And for me personally, I found it very, very fast pace and um, the distances are so big, you know, if you, anytime I wanted to go see a friend, it was like at least an hour or more. Um, and in Montreal, if you live in Montreal Island, it's maybe 15, 20 minutes. Um, so in that sense, I find the, the, those differences. The other differences in terms of economy, obviously Mont Toronto is much better economy than Montreal. That's what I find. I find if you want opportunities and challenges to grow and expand, uh, and also in terms of like, um, innovation like if i look at law firms in toronto how they function and i look at certain law firms many law firms here sometimes it's like in the we're like back in the middle ages over here compared to over there so for me those are the differences that i that i see um so if i ask you uh because you know our clients are from everywhere in the world and they want to immigrate i mean to other provinces too but often it's montreal or toronto what's your impression um well i don't have that big of a knowledge of what's going on in toronto uh i think what you said is probably how I would see it in a kind of um, very general way. Uh, I think regarding the job market, uh, the labor market, I think it's very, again, depending on the field. There's mm -hmm. booming fields in Montreal that don't exist anywhere else uh, in Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, when you think of artificial intelligence, it's a hub here in Montreal um, that doesn't exist in other places. Right. Uh, when you think of um, of the gaming industry. Ubisoft. Video, yes, of course. So um, it is said that Montreal is the, the capital of uh, the gaming industry in the world. Mm. So, um, so there's a lot going on in Montreal that doesn't exist uh, in other places. As for the culture aspect, um, Quebec has always had its own culture. Um, and so, yes, for sure, it's very different from what you'll find in Toronto. Um, I'm not sure I can really generalize and say that um, one is red and one is blue or like, I think it's very... It depends on where you are. Even on just the island of Montreal, you change neighborhoods and the feel is completely different. Mm -hmm. So um, I think if people have the chance of visiting both and seeing how they feel in both cities, I think it's always the best way of choosing. But then again, not everyone has that opportunity, but um, they're very, very different. They're very different for sure. But again, really regarding the, the work environment, there's research to be done. Some mm -hmm. fields are, like you said, much more advanced in Toronto mm -hmm. and some are more advanced in Montreal or just um, maybe might fit more with the quality of life that some people might be looking mm -hmm. for. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, now let's talk about the current present situation, a little bit about COVID-19. Um, what are your thoughts about how future employment uh, in Canada or in Quebec will be affected um, post-COVID? So this is a very interesting but difficult question. Um, 
again, this is ongoing. We're May 29th, 2020. Um, Montreal is still a red zone. Montreal is still uh, confined mm -hmm. uh, for the most part. We don't know what's going to happen. That's like my disclaimer to start mm -hmm. out with. Everything's kind of up in the air. Um, what I think, so this is all a hypothesis, but what I think might happen is um, remote work, I think, will be much more present, will be normalized. I think uh, it won't be like just like this one guy in the office that doesn't uh, come to the office. I think it'll be, I think it would be kind of a bit of a hypocrite thing for bosses to say, that, no, 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 I need you to be at work five days a week. You've seen right. that people are competent and are um, able to, to perform uh, remotely. So mm -hmm. I think that just also financially, it'll be easier for some small businesses to not have to pay for rent uh, mm -hmm. for commercial rent. Um, so I think that's one thing that's going to change. Um, I think some, indus some industries will suffer for many years uh, when you think of culture and uh, arts mm -hmm. and uh, tourism. I think we'll have a, a rough time uh, getting back to where they were. It's important to know that um, we were at, uh, at full employment really before COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, now, some people say that it used to be an employee's market and that it will turn into an employer's market mm -hmm. because so many people lost their jobs. I think we're now at 17, 17%. Um, of unemployment. Uh, yes, I think, let me, I should verify that's that, but I think that's what I heard uh, today. Um, and before COVID it was? I think we were at 4.5%, mm -hmm. uh, which is basically everybody that wanted to work or that could work was working. Right. Okay. Um, so it doesn't mean that it was good jobs and it doesn't mean that it was the jobs that people wanted, but it meant that people were working. Uh, so now a lot of, once we deconfine, a lot of people are just going to go back to the job, the job they had, but it's important to know that the Quebec market is built of small companies. I think about um, 80% of uh, the market is small companies. So those are the companies that are at risk right mm -hmm. now um, and that might not reopen. Mm -hmm. So if they can't uh, make it through the storm, then these people are going to be looking for work. And so that's why we don't know what's going to happen because we don't know who's not going to survive and we don't know who's going to be looking and we don't know if they're all going to be looking in one field or if it's going to be really dispersed or it's hard to tell. So mm. I think some industries will be hit more than others uh, for obvious reasons. Let's say you're um, a professional dancer. Well, yes, you could because we're all talking about doing things online, digitalizing work, but uh, someone dancing on a stage will never have the same field as someone dancing on my tiny little screen, right? Yeah. So um, before we can um, have people grouped together in a small room to watch a show, it's going to take time and that's going to hurt some industries. Um, so we just don't know for how long or how exactly, but I think that's mainly what we'll see. Mm -hmm. I think about uh, the dance world. So myself, I dance salsa and I mostly dance tango. And it's such a hobby of mine and it's such a passion of mine. Um, before COVID-19, I was dancing um, three, four times a week, lessons, milongas, the evenings where you go dance, close embrace, you know, and now everything is shut down. I haven't uh, danced, I dance sometimes with my husband, but it's not the same as going to a milonga where you dance with like 10, 15 different partners in one night and you socialize. And I know a lot of tango teachers and everybody's trying to do online courses and things like that, but it's very, very, very difficult because, you know, learning tango online, it's so hard because you, you have to be physically present to, to feel and touch it and, and know how to make the moves. Uh, and the tango schools, you know, they, they already, they function because the, the directors or the owners, they do it because they're passionate about it. And, you know, when you go to a tango, it's like $5, $10. So they're already kind of barely surviving in terms of, you know, the art artist world. And now with this, nobody goes. Um, you can't. And a lot of, in the tango community, a big percentage of people are over 70 and 80 years old. So they're also the at-risk people. But those people really needed tango in their life, you know, so badly. So I'm... I'm concerned as to what's going to happen with the salsa teachers, tango teachers, the shows and things like that. And I think, like you said, they're, um, they're going to be very affected. 
And I don't know if in the future people will be comfortable going to a milonga and close embrace cheek to cheek dancing tango. Uh, I, 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 I'm hopeful that things will get better and that we can get back to that because it's, it offers such a good quality of life, you know? And there's many different theories as to how we'll go back to normal, how normal used to be. Um, some people say that we have to wait for for vaccination, right? So once the vaccine is, is out there, then everybody's safe and we can go back to doing what we used to do. Some people are saying that it'll be about testing. So they were describing like this type of machine that you could put, let's say, um, at airports. So right before you board a plane, you would like put your finger in or something and then it would say instantly if you have COVID-19 right. or not. Right, right. Test everybody entering a belonga. Then you could say, okay, you're all, everybody here is clean, guys. We're good. That would be good. That would be good. So yeah. it might be futuristic. It might be just a yes. theory. We don't know yet. But there's there's a lot of uh, scientists and there are, there's a lot of people working on these solutions mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of more individualistic uh, part, what what are you seeing in terms of people's reaction to COVID, like confinement, relationship, productivity? What has been your experience? Um, again, it varies a lot. I'd say um, it's important to remember that human beings are social beings. So mm -hmm. being cut from the world is very hard on certain people. Mm -hmm. And there, there's a lot of suffering going on. And uh, it's very quiet suffering because everybody's alone and not necessarily talking about it. Mm -hmm. um, and get this weird, uh, distorted vision of the world through social media where everybody posts like the bread that they baked and the exercise that they're doing and the beautiful achievements right. but some people are at home seeing all this beauty and thinking people are doing great stuff and i'm here and i'm not feeling well mm -hmm. so there's a lot of uh, loneliness i think that's one thing that we see um there's people reevaluating their lives like we've said before thinking that maybe maybe i like this lifestyle of going slower and spending mm -hmm. more time with my family or exercising or doing things that I love. So I think people are, some people are reassessing. I think on some families it's hard um, because it's, it's hard to care for a child 24 mm seven. -hmm. Uh, people say that it takes a village to, to raise a child and there's no more village right now. Mm -hmm. People are alone with their children and that can cause uh, different issues. Mm -hmm. And especially when these people are asked to work full time at the same time, it's hard to, to be a perfect parent and a perfect employee at the same time. Mm -hmm. it's impossible so uh, it's um it's hard uh, for people also to realize that they're not superheroes and mm -hmm. they can only do what they can do um so that's what i'm hearing mostly there's a lot of doubt and there's a lot of people are scared and are wondering um how it'll be once we deconfine um some people are hopeful uh, like we said before, I also hope that there's positive change that comes out of this. Some people are really thinking of the environment and thinking, well, it's a good thing that we're pausing all this madness that we're usually doing. And hopefully we don't pick up where we left off and, and find new ways of doing what we used to do. Mm -hmm. I find for me personally, um, the even though I, I, I try not to do the overproductive thing, it I don't know why it just kind of takes over because I think when we're not used, when we don't have that social aspect of our lives, like for example, last week I, I went to the backyard of a very good friend of mine and we had a social distancing conversation and, you know, just hang out for two hours. When I came home, I didn't feel that need to do all the stuff I have to do because I just felt more relaxed because, you know, I, I, I think when we don't have that part, we start just filling up the time with a lot of things. So, um, so there's a lot of things going on, you know, in our law firm where we moved out of our office, we're moving into a new office in Ville Saint Laurent. Uh, I'm currently pregnant, having a baby in September, preparing a baby room, um, you know, house projects. And at the same time, staff working remotely from home. There's a lot to do. Uh, but I find it's like good and bad, you know, in a way it's like, Oh, now I have the time to do all these good things. That's amazing. But then what happens is there could be a burnout, you know, it could be just like you do so much and then you're just like, Oh, why am I so tired? And it's like, well, you're pregnant and you're doing all this stuff. And it's, so I'm trying to be mindful and be like, you know, it's not a race and just one step at a time. And I think, uh, I, one of my friends was telling me there's two types of people during COVID, the people that, 
end up just being really relaxed and taking the time. And there's the people that are just like overproductive and just, they can't stop being productive. Yeah. I think, um, I think we are who we are. And, uh, even in a crisis, we still are who we are. And I think people that tend to work hard and maybe sometimes too much will do so in a time like this. And yeah. I think uh, people that are, uh, used to being more mindful will be mindful of this particular situation but uh it's it's like you said it's a good moment to, to reflect on that and maybe think about what it is that we actually want exactly um so a couple more questions before we conclude um could you give us one success story from someone who seek your services um there's there's a lot of success stories not because we're, we're great we are great but not because we're great but because uh, I think human beings have this beautiful asset that is to, to reinvent themselves um, when they need to and when they want to. Um, so success stories, uh, I could tell you about small changes or big changes. Um, we often think of a success story being like a huge change. For example, I, I worked once with a man who uh, was in the financial world for a long time. He worked in uh, in banks and insurance companies and was mm -hmm. like always looking at numbers and thinking about money and so finance really and um when they realized that he he spent all of his weekends at chalets or camping in the woods and he was like why am i spending all this time is in nature is it because it's calming me down from my job or is it because i just really enjoy being out there in nature and he realized that he really liked being active and he really liked being physical and he really liked being outside and he was just sick of working inside mm -hmm. and realizing this he completely changed his focus and decided to quit his job go back to school at 43 45 something like that um years old and uh, decided to become um so we'll, i'm gonna mess up the term but um is also a water technician really mm -hmm. so now he works for the city and uh, make sure that uh, that we're drinking clean and uh, and good water. So, mm -hmm. uh, so he's out um, like he gets calls in the middle of the night and he's quick, quick, go look at this water line and he fixes things and uh, does testing on the water to see if the chemistry is right and he loves it. So that could be one type of success story that we could see. So like a big change, but often I see many small changes that are just as much as a success to me. Um, for example, I've seen people um, take a break, just stop working for a month, uh, catch your breath, and go back. Uh, I've seen people um, realize that they want to do exactly the job that they're doing, but with a different team. Mm -hmm. Or I've seen people um, realize that they've grown enough in their career to start their own business, but do exactly what they were doing, but for their own uh, profit, right? So. I think all of these are, are success stories that, that I see uh, on a daily basis. And would you say, I feel that when people come to see you or make that first step, that first phone call, it takes courage to do that. It takes a lot of courage. Uh, the process of guidance counseling is very uncomfortable. Uh, I'd say that therapy is uncomfortable because you go, you go to therapy and you look at things that make you suffer. Uh, but guidance counseling is also very uncomfortable because you look at things that make you suffer and then you're asked to make changes and changing is not something that human being human beings really enjoy it's uh, it's unsafe you don't know what the outcome is going to be it it requires effort it requires time sometimes money um, it changes your routine it changes your lifestyle so uh, yes it, it it need you need a lot of courage to be able to pick up that phone and and yes. And get that first appointment but it can pay off um i mean my husband wants me to switch from mac to pc and that's like it i'm trying to tap into my courage to do that because i've been using macs for over 10 years and it's if that is hard i can you know imagine changing your career right um what is the best way to reach you and familiarize with the services you offer at salto Jose? Yeah, I think the easiest way is really visiting our website. There's a lot of information there about what we do and how we do it. So uh, it's uh, saltoconseil.com. Awesome. Uh, do you, are you offering any video sessions right now? 
Yes, we are. Everything is done remotely. Uh, I'm in the office right now, but I'm alone and I'm always alone in the office. Uh, same for the other counselors. So uh, yeah, everything is done remotely right now and for a little while. I think. Nice. And do you have any upcoming interesting projects with Salto? Uh, so Salto has had for a bit more than a year now a podcast running. Mm -hmm. uh, so the podcast is continuing. We had a short uh, edition on COVID-19 that you were a part of. Thank you again. Um, oh. So the, uh, the COVID-19 uh, edition is coming to an end with one last episode uh, coming up shortly. And uh, we'll be coming back with uh, our regular programming uh, soon after that. And uh, we're launching a blog very soon nice. about um, different, in different issues uh, regarding uh, labor market, uh, personality, um, mental health at work. Uh, so yeah, different uh, themes like that. Nice. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Amy. This, I mean, I think we could talk forever. I mean, it's just the, the, the information is so interesting and I have so many questions uh, that you can answer. So maybe we'll do this again one day with like other topics. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Here's to you. Cheers to our mugs. You gave me the idea to make office mugs. So these are our, our mugs. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on our channel again very soon. Thanks for having me. I'll be back anytime you want me to hear. Awesome. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.